The chairman, Benny Thompson, is gaveling down for that 10-minute recess. I'm here with Katie Turr. Katie, we have seen an extraordinarily detailed exposition with videotape uh, from Bill Stepien, who could not be here today because his wife went into labor for the delivery of their child, and also from Bill Barr, the former attorney general, from the deputy attorney general, Richard Donahue, uh, repeatedly uh, Jason Miller from the campaign as well repeatedly pointing out that they told President Trump during election night and after that the early returns, the day of election returns, were going to be counted early. They were going to show a favoritism that is inherent. It has been for 40 or 50 years since mail-in balloting has taken place. A favoritism for Republican voters, especially in this campaign year of 2020, because of the pandemic, there were more, proportionally more mail-in voters compared to day of voters, and that that would change over preceding days, that he should not declare victory on election night as he did, that he should not declare it until they had a better count, and that he could not rely on that, and that everyone was on board except, of course, the president of the United States pushing back, ignoring the advice from Bill Stepien, going out that night, and then repeating that lie, repeating that lie day after day to the point that eventually the attorney general on December 14th resigned because he thought that the president was no longer even listening to the Justice Department explanations that they had investigated all of the false claims and that Rudy Giuliani on election night and thereafter was the only person, along with the other cohorts, Sidney Powell, Peter Navarro, of the conspiracy theories that were telling him that he had won the election and that Rudy Giuliani on election night, when he was talking to the president of the United States, was intoxicated. Katie, devastating uh, testimony, taking apart the big lie. It was so detailed and so thorough, and it went day by day into the, uh, from Election Day and into the aftermath of Election Day when Donald Trump just kept looking for more and more excuses for why he lost. Um, one note on Bill Stepien and the mail-in ballots, he even testified that he had a meeting with the president and Kevin McCarthy over the summer, and Kevin McCarthy was on his side for this, saying, don't go after mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots can be good for you. Don't demonize mail-in ballots. Obviously, that did not work. Um, but the big takeaway here, Andrea, as you so eloquently laid out, is that they told him. They told them how it was going to go, and when it happened, they told him he lost. And then when he said, well, what about this fraud? They said, okay, fine, we looked into it. It's not there. They told him over and over and over again, knocking down each individual allegation that he had. Richard Donahue a moment ago, the former acting deputy AG, who we just heard from last there, I mean, that was striking, the way that he said... Donald Trump would bring him an allegation, and he would say, okay, I, we've seen this allegation. We've run it down. We've interviewed the witnesses. The evidence does not support that allegation over and over and over again. They just kept coming up with more and more stuff that it, they had to chase all these things down. Um, it was remarkable. And then just to hit on that last point you said a moment ago, all of his aides were telling him to hold on, to wait for the votes to come in, to be reasonable, to be on team normal, as Bill Stepien uh, said. But instead, they implied that he didn't listen to his aides and his advisors or his lawyers. He listened to the, to the guy who was drinking, the guy who was drunk at the White House party. And that's who we went with in the weeks and months after the election. It, it was a compelling two hours, even without the in-person testimony from Bill exactly. Stepien. And Katie, I want to bring in Ali Vitali, who was in the hearing room, and our panel, who is also back with us, the former U.S. attorney, uh, Joyce Vance, of course, from Alabama, former FBI assistant director for counterintelligence, Frank Figlusi, former Republican national chairman and MSNBC contributor, Michael Steele, and MSNBC chief legal correspondent, Ari Melber, host of The Beat, Beat, of course, at 6 Eastern on MSNBC. And I want to throw out one question that comes to mind, uh, just as a sort of devil's advocate question here. Does the fact that the president of the United States kept arguing with Richard Donahue, with William Barr, with Bill Stepien, with Jason Miller, with all of his credible advisors, uh, and kept insisting that there was fraud despite all the evidence they were presenting him, does that undermine the essential case of this committee that he, with foreknowledge, even though he was advised, that he, with knowledge, 
that he had lost went ahead with the big lie. Ali Vitali, let me go throw that out first to you. Well, look, I think that what the committee is arguing here is a case of cause and no effect, showing that there were meetings between everyone at the highest echelons of the White House and the Trump campaign apparatus in which he was told repeatedly, the former president, that he had lost the election. And the way that Bill Barr described it as whack-a-mole, repeatedly going and taking down each of these new claims that the former president would come up with, whether it was Dominion voting or others that were ballots that were lost or in suitcases or, or being being brought in all of these different claims the Department of Justice and others in his campaign orbit <coughs> would knock down and then you're seeing the no effect piece of it which is that then the committee in the room showing video of the former president saying those claims anyway and acting as if they were true it's also giving us a little bit more into the mindset of the way that this committee is going to move on going forward the way they're going to be setting this narrative, which is in some cases meeting by meeting, day by day, establishing the fact that the big lie and the push to defraud the electorate was coming from the top down, as opposed to it being some rogue aides at the bottom of this campaign apparatus pushing these ideas. What we're seeing now quite clearly is former President Donald Trump in tandem with Rudy Giuliani leading that charge, despite everyone else saying it was bogus. But just, just a quick question, though, does the Bill Barr final comments before his resignation, or explaining his resignation, indicate that the president was somehow detached from reality? Well, that's what he's saying. I think that's a really striking claim right there. But if you're, again, the acting president, and I'm sure that we'll hear this from Trump in, you know, moments when he responds, however he responds, I'm sure that's something that he's going to seize on. But certainly that's a striking thing for someone to say, the man who's the attorney general of the United States, whether he's departing or otherwise, saying that if Trump believed this stuff, that he had been detached from reality. That is incredible. Ali Vitali, thank you. Ari Melber, let's talk about intent here because I know this is not um, the court of law, but if this does move to the court of law, then you're going to have to establish intent. And it does go back to the suitcase analogy that we were talking about earlier. I mean, we, we just saw them lay out time and again, his advisors, his lawyers, his attorney general, his acting deputy attorney general, uh, his, his family saying that, you know, you should hold on and wait for the ballots to come in or then, hey, there's no fraud. We've run all this down. You lost the election. If he still is saying, I don't believe it, at what point does it not matter any longer whether he believes it or not? Well, it's a great, well, it's a great question, question because, because some of this intent testimony we just saw was really damning. We were previewing it, talking about whether you know it's not your suitcase and you're stealing it, right, what you referenced, or you're confused. The way they built this up from the very top of the Trump org chart, the people you used to cover that we remember watching you out in the field with, campaign manager, campaign lawyers, White House lawyers, Bill Barr, your daughter, Almost everyone to a fault except for Giuliani saying, you lost. And they built up this testimony today, Katie, in a way that showed it wasn't that Donald Trump, according to the committee's evidence, was confused about the facts. It's that he never cared about the facts to begin with. And that cuts against uh, what was memorably des described on Seinfeld as the Costanza defense. <laughs> if you believe it, Jerry, it's not a lie. And what they're saying is... No, he didn't believe it because he didn't care because before the numbers even came in, he was told he was losing and he said, I'll declare victory anyway. That's, That's exactly, exactly what Bill Barr said. He never had an interest in what the actual facts were. That's a quote from Bill Barr in that testimony. Andrea. And what we've done is, uh, what they have done is seated their next panel of witnesses. So Ben Ginsburg is a noted Republican election legal expert. He was the lead Republican expert who won basically the predicate for Bush v. Gore, the Florida recount so famously uh, done to George W. Bush's victorious win by the Supreme Court's decision in 2000. Next to him, we see B.J. Pack. He is the U.S. attorney for Georgia who resigned because he was about to be fired under the pressure from the former president at the time to Brad Raffensperger and all the others in the chain of command there when he was claiming there was election fraud and there was not. And Al Schmidt is the only Republican member of the city commissioners in Philadelphia who was similarly being pressured to try to overturn the Pennsylvania uh, vote, which in fact 
was won by some 80,000 votes by Joe Biden, and they found no evidence, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court, as did some of these other cases. No evidence at all. Uh, Joyce Vance, weigh in here on the whole issue of intent and the foreknowledge, which clearly was made, was established that he was told in advance, he was told in a briefing in the summer of 2020, he was told on election day, election night, that the mail-in balloting that was yet to be counted after the election day counting was uh, going to favor the Democrats, and that the, it was increasingly looking like he had lost and he should not declare a victory. And he kept persisting, Joyce, in arguing with Bill Barr even in December that all of these conspiracy theories from Rudy Giuliani were true. Prosecutors call that willful blindness, Andrea. And the D.C. Circuit, the court that the former president could conceivably find himself prosecuted in if Merrick Garland decides that that's appropriate, has a tradition of hearing that sort of a, a way for the government to prove a defendant has knowledge of important facts. You can't avoid criminal liability just by sticking your head in the sand and wishing the truth away. And so if the former president were to be indicted, it's very likely that prosecutors' theory would be he actually knew, and if he didn't know, he was willfully blind. There's powerful evidence of that today. The testimony from the former attorney general is compelling when he talks about the example in Detroit, where he's told by Bill Barr, there's nothing wrong with these boxes of ballots that are going in. That's the process in Detroit. And then Trump goes on the following, uh, the following day on TV and blows it up, says it's indicia of fraud. But we have to remember how difficult this case is for DOJ to build, because Bill Barr resigns from his position as attorney general and in his resignation praises the former president. So this is not clear cut for DJ in some regards. So it's been about...